Alright, so it's been a while since I made a video and I thought I would make one on JSON parsing in Haskell uh, and some sort of details that you might want to deal with uh, when you do this. Um, for this example, we're going to be using this page, jsonplaceholder.typical.com. Uh, this is just useful as a source of values. Right? We're going to be decoding these values. Uh, some of them with custom types. Uh, we have a company type here. We have an address type here, uh, etc. And so, yeah, let's uh, actually get going with this. And let's copy this, by the way. And so I'm going to start out here with just a stack new uh, JSON tutorial control. We're just going to do the basic template. This is sort of business as usual, of course. Up on. We don't need to start that there. We will go into JSON tutorial and do git init. And here we're going to open this. Now it's going to say, or ask rather, do you want to open this in a container? And of course we are opening it in a container and here if we do stack run we should be seeing that this all runs and uh, first we're gonna just add some some libraries ASON this is for JSON decoding encoding and decoding uh, we're also gonna add real uh, and HTTP client. This is, of course, to in order to make these actual uh, HTTP calls. Also, HTTP client TLS for HTTPS. If we do stack build now, we should be seeing that these are downloaded and built, compiled, etc. Uh, Rio here is just a I'm using it as a standard library. It's not really needed necessarily in this case, but it's a reasonable sort of base to work off, especially, especially for examples and so on. So what we're going to do here is actually import Rio and import prelude only for put Sterling. Also, we're going to be needing read later. Uh, we'll get to there. So we're going to be doing some REPL sort of driven development um, in order to sort of look at the intermediate results of a lot of these things. So let's start with a function that just gets some data from the internet. Import qualified HTTP client as HTTP and let's do TLS, new TLS manager. And this will become clear why we're doing this. I'm also going to make a value here that is a manager, IO of manager rather. Is that really needed though? No, it's not needed. Let's skip that. Uh, if we save this, what happens now? We're going to say new TLS manager here. This is not used. So let's just say get users content will be, well, IO of lazy byte string for now. Get users content. This is just so we can see what's actually going on here. There are a few steps to to do here. So we're going to start with a request. And so we use HTTP parse request with a URL. And here I've saved this, of course. So what happens now? Well, we're going to have to return IO of L byte string here. And so L byte string is just an alias for a lazy byte string. Uh, L byte string 
we have this because of Rio. Uh, Rio exports this as a lazy, lazy byte string alias. Um, so what we can do now is we can say um, HTTP LBS. Let's see if we can import qualified network HTTP client as HTTP. And I will show you the this function here. takes a manager and a request and a manager and then spits out this uh, response structure. So let's create a manager in here. Uh, this is really just for now. We're going to take this as an argument uh, later. And so now we have the request, we have the managers. We can actually just say HTTP, uh, HTTP, um, HTTP LBS, which is lazy byte string something or other, uh, with our request and our manager. However, we have to actually call something on this. So here, X, we're asking what should go here if we map something over IO of response, basically. Well, it needs to take a response of a lazy byte string and return lazy byte string. And so the, here's a function that actually does that, HTTP response body. And there you go, we have that. So get users content. Uh, let's see if we can execute that and we can. This gives us basically just the, the string with the content inside of it, right? So, Let's sort of take a look at what do we need to do in order to take that and turn it into usable data. Let's look at this and formulate a plan with regards to what do we do with all of this data, right? Uh, let's say we have a structure called user. User has fields. It has an ID field. Let's actually say user ID for now. Uh, we're actually going to get rid of this, and I'm going to show how. So user ID uh, is a, well, let's say it's an int. This probably would be an integer. Username is a text. We're going to make all of these strict. User username, which is very awkward, but... user email. Let's do this one for now. Deriving EQ and show. Also generic. So we're going to be importing some Opa. There you go. So now we're importing ASON as well. And we're also going to be importing some unqualified stuff uh, from JSON. Also, we should import to JSON as well as this operator. It will become clear why later. So now we have our data structure here, and I've derived some things, which means essentially asking Haskell to generate some code for us. So we have equality checks and how to show it in the terminal, and also generic. Generic is a way of basically saying, generate the structure of this type. Basically type information about it that the compiler can use. So what we can do with this is we can say, uh, let's say, to JSON for user, where to JSON equals uh, JSON dot generic to JSON with some options. And here we can actually do default options. So let's see what that gives us. We're going to create 
uh, we're gonna do encode import qualified data JSON as JSON. So JSON encode will take a structure of some kind. Uh, we're gonna create a user here. So let's pass user ID equals one, username, hello, user username, hello username, and user email, hello at hello.com. And now we can see that it has generated the code for outputting JSON from this, but we're getting all of these, right? So we're getting the prefixes and we don't really want that. So what we're gonna do here is say JSON options with the string user. Uh, and we're gonna create a function here that is called JSON options. It returns a, it takes a string, returns a JSON dot options. This is a structure that you use for determining how to generate code. We're gonna call this prefix here. Uh, let's actually pull up this. I'm gonna pull up the documentation for JSON here. Options. So, If I could find this. So we have this default options. This creates the default options with all the default values that you might have. There is this field inside of the structure called field label, field label modifier. So if we just do an experiment here and we say JSON default options and we modify JSON field label modifier to always be returning hello or hello. Now we can see that this basically says whatever key you have, it's just hello. This is obviously not what we want. In reality, of course, this function here is a function from, from string to string, which is run on each field label. So, so we have um, prefix length. Let's take the length of prefix and we're gonna drop, drop this from the string that we have. We're gonna see how that affects these. Now we can see we have dropped the user prefix, but all of our keys are uppercase because that's what remains. So we dropped that prefix, but we also need to do slightly more. Uh, so now we can uh, combine this with a function that uh, lowercases the first character. Basically, it lowercase is the first character. We should be seeing that this will solve our issue. So here, lowercase first character is a function. Lowercase first character equals, so here we're gonna just match on this. C here is a character, of course. Uh, data char, no, char to lower on C combined with the rest. And we also have to match, of course, the empty prefix here or the empty pattern. And now import data dot char. Actually, let's say to lower here. And let's drop this here. So what does this give us? Opa. Now we get email, username, and name. 
just like this, we get ID. So now it seems like we've managed to do this, right? This means, effectively, we can just say, well, from JSON is this, and that has a function called parse JSON. And gen it can be generated with generic parse JSON. So now, uh, potentially, we could actually say, get users, let's just say this is get users now. And we're gonna combine this with what? So we want to say, this is either going to be a string or a list of user. So we need a function that takes a byte string and returns either string or user. This happens to be the function JSON, JSON either decode. So we're going to copy that. And now we have that. We can call this get users is what we've called it now. This now gets us our users. Of course, we've only decoded part of it, right? And that's fine. Uh, we're going to, I should have saved this, of course, hang on. Let's have both of these so we can sort of take a look at uh, both of these. Oh, I've removed some code up here. Get users content will now get us the old value of uh, these. Let's essentially repeat this process now except perhaps the to JSON because it's not really needed. Um, let's actually drop that. And now let's do address. Address. And what fields do we have in address? Well, we have street, suite, <laughs> city, etc. Um, street, suite. And yes, I am aware the types are wrong. Uh, city, zip code. And we have geo, which is itself uh, a type. Let's call that a geo. The zip code is a text, city is a text, suite. Suite, why, why would you have this? Um, so street is a text as well. Let's say address here, address. We still have not defined geo, so let's do that, geo. Uh, we can remove some of these, of course. Let's geo lat and geo lun. These are texts, but I kind of want them to be floats. Because we can see in the actual source data here that they're strings. But doesn't it make sense for them to be floats? I kind of feel like it does. So we're going to actually have to implement something special here, and I will show you what that means. So yeah, let's actually show running this, what this would actually mean if we were doing this now. So we're going to call get users. Uh, and here we don't have address. User address is an address. Get users, error in geo address, um, address geo lat, parsing float failed, unexpected string. So we can't rely here on the default implementation, right? We have this generics, it's supposed to do everything nicely for us, it's supposed to turn this into the proper thing. And geo here happens to be not, it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, we have strings in the source data, and we want floats. So we're going to have to do something custom, and that's fine. So we're going to call a function called with object here, which basically says, I'm looking for an object from the JSON, right? And we're going to call this geo here. And here we are past the object. We're going to enter monadic context here. This is a parser, 
which is a monadic parser. So here, uh, let's call it lat string is equal to O. And then we're using this operator that I imported before, which is look up this key. And so here we're going to say lat and uh, lung string is lung and yeah uh, we're going to do this in a two-step process basically let um, geo lat equals read uh, of lat string and geo lung of course is lung string pure geo of geo lat and geo lung will this work it should work and now we can see that we're converting right so here i've written a custom json parser or well not json parser it is just a uh, custom implementation of parse.json for an object because we want some custom behavior. You're always fine with using this generic stuff for when you can, and then you can sort of drop down into the actual, no, no, I definitely want to do my custom stuff here because there's something that annoys me or I need some modification of the source data, basically. But other than that, you can see we're fine with everything else. So let's look at the source data again. Get users content is what we want. And we have phone, website, and company. So company is a new type uh, that we have to define. Um, let's actually add the other fields first because it's simple. So we have user phone, user website. These are both text. A little bit disappointing perhaps. Uh, and then we have user company. Company is its own type. We're going to do the same thing for company that we did for everything else. And so here, we're just going to essentially come company. How many fields do we have? Three. Delete two of these. And BS. Indeed. Company, a company needs BS for sure. And catch phrase. Company needs a catch phrase. So I might say that's BS as well. Um, does this seem like it might suffice? We haven't added these to user. We, we, do, we have, okay. Get users. And now we're getting all of the data, right? So you might notice, of course, right? There's some annoyance going on here, right? We have all of these prefixes. And it's fine, of course, to have these prefixes. What it does is it makes it very easy to see which accessor we're using in certain places, right? But it does mean that we will have to always be referring to user ID and user company, et cetera, et cetera. Some might not like this, some might. Both of these are fine. If you're not interested in sort of the alternative, feel free to just stop here. We have everything we need here to, uh, in order to parse JSON, as you can see. We're parsing uh, all of these structures into a predictable format. We're validating essentially the incoming data uh, based on simple type rules, not you know validation on with smart logic or anything. Um, we're doing some special parsing of these values and so on, and that's nice. Uh, if we were to use not these prefixes, we could. Uh, do let's uh, let's implement this for to some extent right so we have id name username email address phone website company 
I'm going to be doing this now just for two structures. But you can sort of imagine how this will play out. The reason I'm doing this for only these structures is because they share names. I'm going to be saving here. And we know now that company doesn't need any special options anymore. So we can pass default options. Same goes for same goes for our user. It doesn't really need special options anymore. We don't need to do any specific processing on, on these uh, field names anymore. We save now. We should be seeing we're getting the same stuff. This is all fine. You might wonder why the prefixes. Well, name, uh, when I hover over name, you can see that name is now a function that actually t can take two different things. And Haskell doesn't have this capability by default. So there's a duplicate record fields uh, extension that you can use uh, when it makes sense. And the big caveat to this is, of course, like if I call name here, it doesn't know which name I'm referring to, right? So it has to sort of make do with context for these things. So name, when I refer to name in code, we're not going to know what it means. So for example, if I were to say get users here, maybe users is equal to get users. And then we do case maybe users of, uh, if we have right, we have users. OK, so far so good. Left E and just uh, throw E. Let's say that. Oh, throw M or not. Error. OK, there you go. Uh, so here, we want to do something with our users. So let's say that we wanted the usernames. Right? And this should be, this should be fine. So this is the name field of the user, right? Uh, map user over users. And now let's say put sterling of show or just print user names. We're also going to add print here. And now you'll see that user here uh, doesn't exist. Why? Or not, not user, name, of course. So name is ambiguous, but it's kind of not, right? Users is actually a list of user, right? This is most definitely a list of users, but it still doesn't know what we're referring to. So we have to essentially add a type signature, user text. And this can be tedious, right? We've moved one issue from one place to another uh, in a way, right? We could also use pattern matching here. So for example, user name, name. This should also give us the, the right thing. So run main will give us all of the users, right? So when you're using something in a pattern matching context and so on, it doesn't really, it's not necessarily an issue to have these duplicate fields. It's fairly nice, right? But the issue here is that we know that this is a user, right? It's kind of, it's kind of tedious, right? So this is either a string or a list of user. Let's put that type annotation there instead. Uh, name, of course. 
Haskell actually knows that this is a list of user. Using this accessor here shouldn't be an issue, right? It should be an obvious type error that we were referring to company. It can't be that name that we're referring to, but it's not, it's not that smart, right? Um, so, actually, there might be type annotation you can use like this. I'm not sure what that is. User to text. So, there's a downside to having these duplicate fields, right? Um, and of course, there might be other ways of dealing with these, but um, the thing that becomes easier is when you do use these pattern matching contexts and so on. Right? I suppose this could be one of those things where, as a team, you might have a preference, right? You might have uh, some preference that sort of overrides this uh, kind of thing. Most people, I think, are using the prefix prefixed versions. So their structures will look like, uh, like these instead. Uh, which is fine. This is really, I would say it's kind of a one-time cost. Um, what you do get from it is you get this fairly, it becomes obvious what you're trying to do, right? So let's add these back. Uh, user. And sort of contrast this, right? Now, of course, we have to do uh, generic parse, parse JSON with our JSON options user. So we're going to do that for this as well, but this is company. So company name catchphrase BS. And now we could just do user name here. This is completely ambiguous. Haskell has no issue understanding that. So this would be one of the main differences that you would see, right? Uh, and this is entirely up to like which trade-off are you are you trying to make, right? But yeah, so I hope this video has been sort of informative in terms of like how do I just do uh, JSON parsing in Haskell? What are some things to think about? Um, and so to, to sort of recap this, we define our structure like this. We define substructures like address and company. And our substructures can, of course, have other substructures, geo here. Uh, when we know that we have a predictable, we have predictable types in terms of, yeah, everything makes sense. Phone is always a text here, and we know what it is in the source data. We know it is in the actual structure here. We can use generic parse JSON or generic to JSON in the case of encoding. We create a helper function for generating this options structure, which decides how to, for example, decode characters uh, or rather fields, right? So here we're dropping whichever prefix we passed in, which in, in this case is company, for example. We're dropping the entire prefix, right? the length of the prefix, and then we're saying lowercase the first character. We have this in line here defined. It's fairly understandable. I've just composed these two functions here. This is compose forward, very, very good operator. And so when, when we have a fairly predictable structure and everything, we can do that. So we've done that for most of these. However, in the case of geo, our source data said, uh, lat and uh, long were actually strings, and I wanted them to be floats. Uh, so here we've defined them as floats, and we're using read here. You should actually use read maybe. They can fail, so you want this to be able to fail. This is just an example. And then we return our parsed structure here. 
So this is how you write sort of a manual instance when you need to. With object basically says, I'm expecting an object here, uh, fail on anything else. So it will fail if it's a string, etc. Here we're getting this uh, closure here that takes uh, an object. This operator here looks in the object for a certain key and gets the content out. The reason here it knows that this lat string is actually a string is because we're reading from it and read takes a string and here we're expecting a float because we're using it as geo lat. This is type inference so Haskell figures out from the way you're using stuff uh, what type stuff should be. And so you can use the prefixed uh, version. This is super popular. If you think this is tedious you can uh, of course, just skip the prefixes. Be aware, though, that your accessors, accessors might be ambiguous. Might be a little bit tedious to do that part. Uh, once we get uh, record dot syntax, or once that's figured out, I suppose we'll probably do that. But yeah, I think that's basically a crash course in JSON parsing in Haskell. Uh, let me know, I guess, in the comments if this made sense, if there's something I should cover maybe in a, another video on this, uh, or if you have it, suggestions for anything else to cover. Okay, ciao. Have a good night.